welcome to Classical Mechanics 2. In this video, we'll explore driven oscillators, linear operators, and Fourier series solutions. We'll start with the regular damped oscillator that we worked out in the last video and see what happens when there's a force that's accelerating the mass according to some function of time. So our equation of motion is now x double dot plus 2 beta x dot plus omega naught squared x is equal to the force as a function of time divided by m. So before we get to solving this, I'm going to do a brief aside to discuss linear operators and inhomogeneous equations. When I talk about operators, I'm talking about differential operators. So this is the differential operator for our system. So d is equal to d squared by dt squared plus 2 beta d by dt plus omega naught squared. Basically what I've done is I've pulled out all of the derivatives in my equation of motion and I'm going to act this as a function on my variable x. So then my equation of motion becomes d acting on x is equal to some function of time. Linear operators have some really nice properties and they're going to show up all over the place in so many different physics problems, both in this class and in other classes. The first of these properties is d acting on a, which is a scalar, times x, which is our variable, is equal to a times d acting on x. And the next is d acting on two functions, x plus y, is equal to d acting on x plus d acting on y. These two properties together define an operator as being linear. Combining these two properties, we arrive at another property that's called superposition, which is used in virtually all fields of physics. So imagine I have two solutions, x1 and x2, that both solve d of x equals zero. We can use this to construct an even more general solution, which is d acting on a times x1 plus b times x2 is equal to zero. And this solution also solves our original equation. Specific solutions in this superposition are weighted sums of all possible linearly independent solutions to this linear operator. The other thing I want to discuss is in homogeneous equations. Homogeneous equations are equations of the form dx equals zero. In homogeneous equations are equations where the differential operator acting on x is equal to something that is not zero, so in this case f of t. Imagine I have somehow found a particular solution, xp of t, to the inhomogeneous equation dx equals f of t. And I already know the homogeneous solutions xh of t to the homogeneous equation dx equals zero. Then I can come up with the most general solution to my original equation dx equals f of t. That solution is going to be the particular solution xp of t plus a linear superposition of the homogeneous solutions. And that's the most general solution that I can have for this equation. It's important to note that I can't put a constant in front of my particular solution here. If I were to do that, I would basically have a times xp of t, which means that d acting on my solution is going to give me a times d acting on my particular solution. And this is going to be a multiple of the solution I'm interested in. So that's why we can't have a constant times the particular solution. Let's imagine for a second that I have a special type of driving force. Imagine I have sinusoidal driving. So that means that my driving force is proportional to cosine omega dt, where omega d is the driving frequency. The equation of motion is then x double dot plus 2 beta x dot plus omega naught squared x is equal to f naught times cosine omega dt. Instead of looking at the real part of the force cosine omega dt, we'll consider the whole complex exponential function. There's a change of variables I'm going to use so that z is equal to x plus i y. This is going to be helpful because I can take advantage of the geometry of the complex plane rather than just a bunch of algebra to help us with our solutions later on. So this is the complex plane, and here's my point z. The x component is the real part of z, and the y component is the imaginary part of z, as we worked out last time. But I can equally well think of this as a plane with polar coordinates on it. Then 
A is the magnitude of Z and delta is its phase. So I can write Z as A e to the I delta. Our equation of motion is then Z double dot plus two beta Z dot plus omega naught squared Z is equal to F naught e to the I omega dt. We solved the homogeneous version of this problem in the last video, so we're just going to focus on finding a particular solution now. The inhomogeneous portion of this equation is f naught e to the i omega dt. It makes sense that our particular solution will involve e to the i omega dt as well, particularly since the derivative of the exponential is that exponential, so that means that we might be able to divide out by that term. Let's try the particular solution z is equal to c e to the i omega dt. When we plug that into the equation of motion, we get c times minus omega d squared plus 2i beta omega d plus omega naught squared times e to the i omega dt is equal to f naught e to the i omega dt. So all of the terms that depend on time cancel out, and we can solve for c in terms of the constants in the problem, f naught, omega d, beta, and omega naught. At the end of the day, we're still interested in finding a real function x and not the complex function z. So c is a complex number, as is e to the i omega dt, so we're going to have to worry about that. And c isn't really in the nicest form to deal with, it's got this 2i beta omega d term in the denominator. So instead of splitting this directly into real and imaginary parts, we're going to use the geometry of the complex plane to write C as an amplitude and a phase. That means that we're looking for the form of C that looks like A e to the i delta. So let's start with the amplitude. I'm going to take C and multiply it by its complex conjugate. The complex conjugate of a complex number a plus ib is equal to a minus ib. So the real parts stay the same, but the imaginary parts differ by a sign. When I multiply c by its complex conjugate, I get a e to the i delta times a e to the minus i delta. e to the i delta and e to the minus i delta multiply together to get 1, and I'm left with a squared, or the amplitude squared. So when I plug c into this equation, I end up with a squared is equal to f naught squared divided by omega naught squared minus omega d squared, quantity squared, plus 4 beta squared times omega d squared. To find the phase, I'll look at the geometry in the complex plane. The point z makes a right angle with the real axis. The legs of this triangle are the imaginary part and the real part of z. Then the angle delta is the arctan of the ratio of the imaginary part to the real part. I'm going to extract this information from C by cleverly multiplying by 1. In this case, I'm going to multiply it by the complex conjugate of C divided by the complex conjugate of C. When I multiply this through, I get A divided by F naught times omega naught squared minus omega d squared minus 2i beta omega d squared. So my real part is proportional to omega naught squared minus omega d squared, and the imaginary part is proportional to 2 beta omega d. Then my phase delta is equal to the arctan of the imaginary part divided by the real part, which is equal to the arctan of 2 beta omega d divided by omega naught squared minus omega d squared. So now let's combine this into an equation for d, which equals c e to the i omega dt, which is equal to a, so our amplitude, times e to the i omega dt plus our phase delta. And I can use this to solve for the particular solution to this equation, which is the real part of z, which equals a times cosine omega dt plus delta. So what does the trajectory of a damped driven oscillator look like? The full solution to this problem is the homogeneous solution that we worked out in the last video, plus the particular solution that we just worked out in this video. The homogeneous solution has the form c1 e to the r1t plus c2 e to the r2t. Both of these terms decay exponentially. And even if there is some oscillatory motion coming from the r's being imaginary, the amplitude of the oscillation still decays exponentially. And to that homogeneous solution, I'll add the particular solution, a times cosine omega dt plus delta. At long times, the homogeneous solution decays to zero, so in the long run, the trajectory just looks like the particular solution. So what does this look like? 
So this is a plot of the amplitude squared as a function of omega d. We'll assume that omega naught, beta, and f naught are fixed, and we're going to scan through the possible driving frequencies for our system. For small driving frequencies, the oscillation amplitude is small and fixed. And as we increase the frequency, the amplitude increases until it reaches a peak at some value omega star. This is a very large amplitude response. And from there, it decays away to zero. So we can find omega star by solving dA by d omega d is equal to zero, which tells us that omega star is equal to the square root of omega naught minus two beta squared. So this is the frequency that maximizes the amplitude response. So as you scan through the driving frequency at some point omega star, you'll have a really large amplitude response. In this problem, we've introduced a lot of notation so far. So let me match up the notation with the physical quantities in the problem. So omega naught is equal to the square root of k over m, and that's the natural frequency for our undamped oscillator. Omega d is the driving frequency of our oscillator. Omega tilde is equal to the square root of omega naught squared minus beta squared, and this is the underdamped frequency. If we have a system with weak damping, so a small k, the underdamped system is going to oscillate at a slightly smaller frequency, and that's this underdamped frequency here. And lastly, we have omega star, which is equal to the square root of omega naught minus two beta squared. And this is the resonant frequency. So this is the system that you would need to drive the system at to achieve the largest response. The last thing I'll talk about is what happens if f isn't sinusoidal. For example, what if it's this square wave? This is periodic, it has period tau, but it isn't sinusoidal. This particular wave is characterized by the width of the signal and the length of time between cycles. To solve problems like this, we can expand this new driving function f of t in a Fourier series. Basically, we're going to be creating a linear superposition of sinusoidal solutions to best approximate the new function. So this is useful because we just worked out the general sinusoidal solution, so our new solution is just going to be superpositions of those solutions. The Fourier expansion of f of t is equal to the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of a n times cosine n omega t plus b n times sine n omega t. And we need to solve for the constants a n and b n. And these are given by a series of integrals. a naught is equal to 1 over tau times the integral from minus tau over 2 to tau over 2 of f of t dt. And the two constants a n and b n for n is greater than or equal to 1 are both going to be given by 2 over tau times an integral from minus tau over 2 to tau over 2 of f of t times cosine n omega t for the a n term and sine n omega t for the b n term. The more terms we keep in the sum, the closer this approximates the true value of f of t. Then the particular solution x p of t is equal to the sum of solutions x n of t for each n in the Fourier series, where x n of t is equal to a n times cosine n omega d t plus delta n, with a n squared equal to a n squared divided by omega naught squared minus n squared omega d squared quantity squared minus 4 n squared beta squared omega d squared. And delta n is equal to the arctan of 2 n beta omega d divided by omega naught squared minus n squared omega d squared. In the next video, we'll start studying interacting systems by looking at coupled oscillators. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.